time to come death, the destroyer of worlds. August 5, 1945, on the order of Harry Truman, Paul Tibbets led a mission to use an atomic weapon for the first time in combat, piloting his B-29 Superfortress, named the Enola Gay after his mother. The aircraft and two other B-29s approached Hiroshima, chosen as a target as a communication centre and troop assembly area. The cargo aboard the Enola Gay was Little Boy, the code name for the uranium-based bomb. The device was unloaded, setting off the barometric pressure sensor, which was set for the predetermined altitude for maximum destructive effect. Little boy fell for about 44 seconds when the electronic circuitry, activated by the barometric trigger, set off a cordite charge inside the bomb, propelling a uranium bullet into the target cylinder containing a stack of nine uranium rings. There was now enough compounded fissionable material in the cylinder to initiate critical mass. This caused a chain reaction of splitting atoms, unleashing the equivalent amount of energy of 15 kilotons of TNT. This genocidal weapon killed 70,000 human beings instantly. It was the largest ever fatality rate from a single weapon. Left were the suffering and the soon to be dead. A second nuclear device, a plutonium-based implosion device, Fat Boy, was dropped on Nagasaki three days later. Japan finally surrendered only after the intervention of the Emperor, who had up until this point kept out of military decisions. His voice was broadcast to the nation for the first time ever. The majority of the listeners could not understand what he was saying, as he was speaking a very cultivated and cloistered variety of Japanese. Whether it was the bomber, or the fear of the Russians who had by then declared war that made them the Japanese finally relent is still debated. Hirohito stated in his broadcast, It is according to the dictates of the time and fate that we have resolved to pave the way for a grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. This was a wordy way of saying that he had surrendered on behalf of the Japanese people. Sanity had finally prevailed and the insane war that cost somewhere in the area of 27,000 lives per day was belatedly yet mercifully ended. Developed countries have not fought each other since, at least not directly. Instead, the Cold War permeated the rest of the century. This raise was first printed in a George Orwell essay printed in October 19th, 1945. He used the term again in a subsequent essay published on March 10, 1946, this time more to the point, arguing that the Soviet Union is making a Cold War with its neighbours. No one can pinpoint exactly when the Cold War started, but it was certainly underway before the end of World War II, with Stalin reneging on agreements regarding uh, Eastern Europe. The advent of nuclear weapons was creating a tension unprecedented in world history. For the first time, war was threatening the very existence of life on planet Earth. Winston Churchill, a lifelong Russophobe, further articulated the language of the Cold War on the 5th of March 1946 in a speech to uh, Westminster College, a small college in Truman's home state. In it, he used the term Iron Curtain and Special Relationship in his effort to articulate the threats the Soviets posed. Churchill did not coin these phrases. They had been used before. However, the speech did popularize and cement them in their Cold War context. The speech is remembered as the Iron Curtain speech. The speech was made to an American audience still in the mindset that the Soviet Union was their wartime ally and helped push the view that the USSR was the new enemy. On the 29th of August 1949, the Soviet Union detonated their first nuclear weapon, made possible with slave labour from the gulags and data stolen from the Manhattan Project. The bomb was almost an exact replica of the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. A nuclear arms race was well underway. At the end of the war, the United States had only a handful of nuclear weapons. More and more were to be built. 
development and testing was ramped up. The center of a nuclear blast was referred to as Ground Zero by nuclear scientists by 1946. Fallout was attested by 1950. Perhaps the most disturbing of these new phrases is atomic shadow, also called a nuclear shadow. The white flash of the bombs dropped on Japan seared and bleached the surface of concrete, asphalt and structures beneath it. An unfortunate person standing between the blast and the surface created a shadow from the light. The flash discoloured the area surrounding the shadow, leaving the area blocked by the victim in its original state. Meanwhile, the heat from the flash either vaporised the creator of the shadow, or their bodies were completely carbonized. The following shockwave blew away the carbonized human remains. All that was left was the apparent human imprint, the shadow. Scientists used these uh, atomic shadows to calculate the blast trajectory and yield of the weapon. Atomic shadow has uh, fallen out of modern uses, but is still worth uh, remembering. Building and testing all these bombs was expensive. The United States was creating the largest military force the world had ever seen. The Los Alamos uh, scientists referred to such financial appropriations as megabucks by 1946. Scientists on both sides worked hard to ensure their weapons could kill more people than their opponents and do it faster and more efficiently. Mega theft surfaced by 1953 as a way to calculate the effectiveness of the devices. Mega theft means one million deaths. By this time, atomic bombs were being replaced by thermonuclear bombs, also called hydrogen bombs. Thermonuclear weapon is considered more scientifically accurate than a hydrogen bomb, but hydrogen bombs still enjoyed some widespread usage to refer to these devices. An atomic bomb was about the equivalent of uh, 1,000 tons of TNT. The first hydrogen bombs exploded with the equivalent of 10,000 tons of TNT. Hydrogen bombs would only grow bigger, making Megadeth possible. The band Megadeth was formed in 1983. The expression, in the ballpark of, also came out of Los Alamos in the following year. The reasoning behind the use of uh, this language is not clear. It, uh, it was probably a reference to the accuracy of the missile defence systems, with the length of a ballpark representing the margin of error. As uh, nuclear stockpiles grew, both the United States and the Soviet Union had enough of these weapons to achieve any strategic ob objective many times over. Overkill was coined to refer to the superfluous and redundant nature of the strategy and these weapons by 1958. Thermonuclear weapon was shortened to nuke by 1959. The verb sense is from 1962, and to nuke something in a microwave is from 1987. In July 1946, two nuclear devices were tested on the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The number of atomic devices tested would reach 23 by 1953. Bikini became a common noun, Bikini with a small b by 1947, originally in French. The first known English recording of our bikini was in 1947 in the Daily Waterloo Courier. It was an article commenting on this new French word. Uh, the article read, The French, it seems, have a new suit uh, plan that is about twice as wide as a piece of string. It is so explosive that they call it a bikini. This story, uh, although a good explanation, is not supported by any real evidence. There are many theories as to where it came from. The most obvious one is the wordplay the, on the apparent prefix by and the fact that um, a bikini comes into its a bitsy parts. But this theory doesn't explain the association with the atoll of this kind of swimwear. Perhaps some association with uh, islands and beaches, further uh, supporting the Daily Waterloo Korea's contention that a woman wearing a bikini had the explosive effect on a man's libido on par with a nuclear explosion. Although the story is probably made up, the article did introduce bikini into English. Scientists involved in our rocket-powered aircraft spoke of breaking a sound barrier. Nobody knew what would happen to an aircraft and its occupant once it reached the speed of sound, or if such speeds for an aircraft were even possible. Charles Elwood Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier on October 14, 1947. The US occupied Japan from 1945 to 1949 before establishing bases and returning governance to the Japanese people. Honcho was first attested in 1947, picked up by US servicemen from the Japanese word for group leader. American uh, troops also occupied the American sector of Germany until 1949 and stayed uh, longer as part of the NATO agreement. US Army facilities uh, featured postal exchange stores, known as PX stores, or the PX, as well as providing a postal service it served as a small shopping facility. One of the items on offer after the war was a pocket knife manufactured by the Swiss uh, knife maker Victorinox. It was uh, called, you can see this on the screen, the officer's uh, messer, meaning 
Officer's knife, and my apologies for any mispronunciation. This was too much of a mouthful for the occupying forces, so the servicemen dubbed it the Swiss Army Knife. Servicemen returning home with the knife had been credited with the global popularity of the device. American military PX stores were much loved by occupied servicemen. In post-war Berlin, a carton of cigarettes from the PX could be traded on the black market for a 1939 Mercedes-Benz. Care package was used shortly after the war, originally uh, called um, the acronym C-A-R-E, uh, Care Package. It was organised by a group of private charities pooling their resources. The form of this phrase shifted and became an acronym for uh, Cooperative for Assistance and Relief Everywhere as the uh, program expanded beyond Europe. The shortening of uh, Rehabilitation Rehab appeared in 1948 in reference to the effort to um, house returning servicemen.